Welcome to the Baptist Health Doc to Doc podcast, a conversation for physicians by physicians, providing insight on the latest in medical practice, research, technology, and innovation in healthcare. Join Baptist Health experts as they offer practical advice for clinicians covering a wide range of specialties. Cancer, neuroscience, orthopedics, and cardiovascular care are just some of the timely discussions you'll find right here on the Doc to Doc podcast. Hi, my name is Steve Hoff. I'm a uh, board-certified cardiac surgeon and fellow of the Heart Rhythm Society. I'm joined today by Mario Pasquale, uh, and we're going to talk a bit about AFib. So, Mario, if you don't mind introducing yourself. Sure. Thanks, Steve. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so, I'm Mario Pasquale. I'm one of the electrophysiologists at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute, also a fellow of the Heart Rhythm Society, and uh, excited to uh, talk a little bit about uh, atrial fibrillation. So today in our Doc to Doc podcast, we'll be discussing atrial fibrillation and primarily its history. Because of the extensive nature of uh, talking about AFib, not only um, how we got to this point, but how we treat AFib um, in the modern sense, we elected to break this up into three different um, podcasts. And uh, today we're going to start with um, uh, a history of um, how we got to this point both from a medical treatment standpoint and a surgical treatment standpoint. Um, and look back at the previous century or so of, uh, of innovation and the development of um, uh, treatments that brought us to this point. So Mario, if you don't mind uh, starting and tell us a little bit about kind of how we got to the modern medical therapy for atrial fib. Absolutely, Steve. And, uh... Like most things in medicine, it's it's absolutely fascinating to you know look back a hundred years, see where we were, and kind of look forward a hundred years and see where we are now. And uh, you know, anytime I can uh, get any history pointers and 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 read about anything in medicine, it's 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 always fascinating to me. So, you know, we know AFib was first kind of described somewhere in the early 1900s. You know, they say in 1909. Uh, Sir Thomas Lewis records the first um, atrial fibrillation on an EKG and begins to really uh, try to figure out what is atrial fibrillation, what are these, what we very well know of, you know, these fib waves on the EKG, what they're all about, and, and what is the mechanism of, of them. Um, you know, in 1935, we, we find our first medical therapy for um, AFib, and that's digitalis, which, um, you know, Bolin recognized that it reduces the ventricular rate dramatically. Uh, even though the, of course, the pulse would remain very irregular, patients would be less uh, tachycardic. Then move down another about, you know, 30, 40 years, and we start, um, you know, Bernard Lowndes starts talking about, well, you know, let's try things to get patients out of atrial fibrillation. And we start experimenting, experimenting with things like cardioversion. And, um, you know, so we start experimenting with cardioversions. We realize that we can actually get patients out of atrial fibrillation by applying some electrical current to their chest wall. Um, and, you know, then we realize, well, that's not, that's definitely not enough. There's really, um, all these patients go back into atrial fibrillation and we start kind of experimenting with more and more medical therapy and now known as beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and multiple antiarrhythmics where, you know, really the therapy or the really the, the change in therapy for atrial fibrillation comes along. And um, I'll kick it back to you in a second is when really surgeons really start to explore the mechanisms of AFib within the heart and what surgical interventions they can have done in order to not just, you know, reset the heart, but actually change the mechanism of firing within the heart. And uh, I know you know that story well, Steve, so I'll turn it back to you for the, uh, you know, cock maze and, and everything you get you guys have done since then. Sure. I'm delighted to do it. Um, yeah, we don't have to go back uh, hundreds of years to the history of digitalis to learn about the surgical history of the treatment of AFib, but we do go back nearly 50 years um, which is really when uh, surgeons started uh, thinking about treating AFib surgically. And interestingly, it didn't start with AFib. And the pioneer on the surgical side for the treatment of AFib is a surgeon named uh, James Cox, who worked at Washington University in St. Louis for really uh, his whole career. And um, Jimmy began in the late 70s and early 80s um, uh, thinking about um, surgical treatment of arrhythmias, and they developed what was at the time 
uh, an incredibly sophisticated way to look at um, epicardial mapping during the time of surgery to understand um, what was going on from an uh, arrhythmia standpoint and how they were affecting this. And interesting that they didn't begin looking at AFib. Their idea was about treating Wolf, Parkinson, White, and uh, AV node reentry tachycardia. Um, that was their focus. And if you talk to Jimmy about this, he'll tell you that he's probably more proud of his work with WPW, which is, you know, now that we understand the mechanisms, is a, you know, straightforward ho hum uh, catheter procedure for Dr. Pasquale. But, um, uh, they worked for several years to develop these models of understanding um, uh, reentry tachycardias and uh, macro reentrant circuits that were leading to these um, uh, arrhythmias. And so it wasn't until the very early 80s that um, they started to turn that focus toward AFib. And so in 1983, um, Dr. Cox began um, uh, thinking about uh, creating um, a, an operation that would um, effectively treat atrial fibrillation. And so they took all everything they learned about wave fronts and macro reentrant circuits and, um, and moved it toward AFib. And there were some iterations. Um, you know, for those of you that know the history of all this, there are numbers that go along with this. There's a Cox maze one, two, three, four, and so on, depending on how um, uh, deep into it you want to get. And uh, so the, the problem with the initial um, iteration of this is um, it caused such a delay in atrial contraction that the atrium actually contracted when it got back into its regular rhythm, actually contracted after the mitral valve closed. And so it was, wasn't very effective. Um, the second iteration was more effective, but was associated with a very high rate of bleeding because of some uh, surgical considerations. So in the end, the Cox Maze 3 was the procedure that we sort of understand as the cut and sew maze procedure. Um, that procedure really was first performed um, uh, in 1987, September of 1987 at Washington University. Um, my understanding is shortly after Dr. Cox's mother had a significant stroke from AFib, interestingly. So um, uh, Dr. Cox, over the next few years, began to um, perform this procedure more and more and, um, and uh, published the first series um, of those maze 3 patients in 1991. Um, it was seven patients at the time. And the thing about the maze procedure was it was extremely effective at controlling these abnormal electrical cycles that uh, we know um, lead to atrial fibrillation. Um, and there are some really important parts of that that we'll explore as we talk more about this. Um, the problem with the maze procedure was and still is that it was heart surgery. And, you know, it required, um, you know, uh, sternotomy and being put on the pump. Um, it was a very complex operation. There were really very few surgeons in the world that could master this technique. And, um, uh, well, it's we've learned a lot of lessons from the effectiveness that Dr. Cox was able to create with um, full, what we'll call them, surgical lines of ablation, lesion sets. Those are the terms that we'll throw around for these um, areas of scarring on the heart that interrupt abnormal uh, electrical cycles. Um, uh, as technology then improved over the next probably 10 years and largely due to work that was done in the lab and in the operating room at Washington University under both Dr. Cox and uh, then later Ralph Damiano, Ralph um, published in 2002 um, the first series of the Cox Mace 4 procedure, which um, replaced a lot of those surgical lines of ablation with um, other energy sources that created this, the, the ultimate goal, which was to create a line of scar within the atrium that wouldn't allow the uh, perpetuation of these macro reentrant circuits that we know lead to AFib. And, uh, and, and at the time when Ralph published this, that, you know, that operation also became less invasive and he performed many of those uh, through a right thoracotomy, still on the heart lung machine, but um, uh, but uh, uh, I think for me a couple of things that are important, and that is 
the importance or the understanding about what causes a complete line of ablation. This is important not only for you, Mario, in the lab, but it is for me in the operating room as well. And you know what Dr. Cox was able to do was make an incision from point A to point B. So he knew if he was going to make a line of ablation from there to there, he could cut it all the way and then sew it up. And it made a complete line in two directions, right? From one end to the other and all the way through the thickness of the myocardium. That's vitally important and has been a little bit of a, um, a loss with some of our um, newer um, energy sources for creating these. But, uh, but we know that that completeness is a, a big important part of this. Um, so uh, I thought what we talk about maybe for the last few minutes here, Mario, was a little bit about mechanisms for AFib. And uh, interestingly for me, um, the first description of the pulmonary veins as being sort of the focus of the initiation of atrial fibrillation came from a, um, um, a description from Michel Hassiger in Paris in 1998, uh, well after Dr. Cox and Dr. Damiano had been publishing all these series on surgical ablation. Um, and I th thought maybe you could spend just a couple minutes telling us about kind of the importance of pulmonary vein isolation as an initiation trigger for AFib and then those macro entrance circuits in the left atrium for propagation. Absolutely. And uh, uh, just like you said, you know, the, the EP also started with very different arrhythmias, you know, the AV notary entry and the WPW and, and the way the catheters used to work is it would actually deliver uh, direct current uh, energy instead of radio frequency energy. And, you know, then in, in 1981, um, you know, the a gentleman by an engineer by the name of Webster starts saying, hey, I think I can make better, ca design better catheters than this. And he starts making, making catheters that can deliver radio frequency energy instead in his garage. They start trialing them at uh, Indiana University and a couple other um, institutions. And, um, they become pretty successful at, at doing these ablations. And, you know, then Hasegari starts becoming very interested in, in AFib. And when I speak to my mentor, you know, Bill Miles from uh, now at the University of Florida, but was in Indiana University at that time, he was a resident. He said, you know, with AFib, it was interesting because we started to notice, you know, they were just starting lung transplantations. And if a patient had a single lung transplant, their incidence of AFib was almost 100%. But in those patients that had a double lung transplant, their incidence of AFib was almost nil. These patients almost never had atrial fibrillation. And, you know, the difference between them is when, you know, you're suturing the pulmonary veins. And so when they would suture just two pulmonary veins versus four pulmonary veins, the incidence of AFib would really go down. And so they started really getting interested in this. And Hasegari kind of realized this as well. And so... You know, he, he was one of the first to go into the, you know, heart and, and do what's called transeptal punctures, which is, you know, absolutely you know, something we do thousands of times a year now, but something back then that was, you know, really just getting started where, you know, you can cross from the right atrium of the heart to the left atrium of the heart, uh, just under fluoroscopy or x-ray, and started to, to infuse some adrenaline into these patients with their normal rhythm. And he noticed that all of a sudden there'd be this oscillation or this spontaneous activity within the pulmonary veins, areas of the heart which really should not conduct electricity, where no myocardial tissue should be present. All of a sudden you had this firing, and soon after this firing, atrial fibrillation would then start. And so that's when we started to realize maybe maybe this is truly the trigger for AFib. And so he started doing what's called pulmonary vein isolation. And they also noticed as they isolated one pulmonary vein, chance of recurrence of AFib was quite high. If they isolated two veins, things got better. And if they isolated four veins, those were certainly their best results. Over the next kind of 10 years, we start to understand that there are absolutely triggers for AFib within the pulmonary veins. And we start doing, getting a lot more physiology. So we start doing more animal studies. And if we actually cut a cross-sectional of the of a of a pig and even now humans, and we look under a microscope, you can get these little myocardial sleeves that are growing out from the left atrium into the pulmonary vein. And these are what we call these pulmonary vein triggers. This is definitely the most common mechanism. I wish and the entire medical community, you know, wishes that we understood AFib completely, but we don't. And so we're still doing a lot of kind of bench work and a lot of work into understanding the full mechanisms of atrial fibrillation. But if we go 
from, you know, procedure, which was probably taking six hours in, you know, 1998 with success rates of around 30%. And you kind of fast forward to today's day and age, you know, we're, we're able to perform pulmonary vein isolations as still the gold standard of AFib, uh, especially paroxysmal AFib in under an hour with a truly low risk procedure, same, same day discharges. Um, and, you know, success rates have never been better with about an 80 to 90% success rate that we can truly eliminate their atrial fibrillation. But, you know, as well as I do, Steve, all AFib is not the same. And that's where we start getting into different types of AFib. And there's, there's different, there's paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which is, you know, what we love to see with electrophysiologists because it means that the atrium is healthy enough where it can go back and forth from AFib to normal sinus rhythm on its own. We know how to manage these patients. We treat them very well. But unfortunately, once a patient's diagnosed with AFib, within the first year, they can certainly transition to what we call persistent and then thereafter, long-standing persistent AFib. And that's when these triggers really start growing out of the pulmonary veins. And, you know, we think of the heart as a really a two-dimensional structure, but really it's becoming more and more apparent that in AFib, three-dimension is certainly the way to think. And so we have an inside of the heart, a mid-aspect, and an epicardium or outside of the heart. And as you know, our ablation is coming from the inside out. And we love ablating, you know, all types of atrial fibrillation, but we're also honest. And as these triggers start going towards the posterior wall, they not only grow in the endocardium, but they're growing towards the midmyocardium as well as the epicardium. And some areas of the heart are going to be much thicker than others. So we can do a lot of ablation from the inside of the heart. And unfortunately, we will not be able to get this full transmural lesion sets and there's now even studies showing that if the endocardium is in normal sinus rhythm, um, there's catheters sitting in the epicardium and shows that the epicardial aspect of the posterior wall or the backside of the atrium is fibrillating. So you have an endocardium in sinus rhythm and epicardial in, in atrial fibrillation. So clearly there can also be dissociation between the uh, endocardium and epicardium. And, you know, right now I think that's where we really, you know, rely on our surgeons. We really have these hybrid ablation approaches to have the best options uh, for our patients. So, you know, I'll push it back to you, Steve, and, and describe a little bit about, you know, what you think about the uh, hybrid procedure, where its advantages are, and, and you know, where you see the future. I think that's that's really uh, an interesting um, topic right now. And that may take us a while. So I think what we'll do is we may use that as a great segue um, to uh, um, our next session. And, uh, and then in our next session, I think what we're going to do is we're going to uh, – talk a little bit about sort of the modern treatment of atrial fibrillation. We'll do it really start with kind of our algorithm for managing these patients. And, you know, that algorithm is going to start with medical therapy, and sometimes it ends up being multiple drugs. We'll, um, if we have time, we'll talk about um, anticoagulation strategies as well, although that may be for episode three. And then we'll talk about um, that decision point for patients um, about whether or not they continue down um, uh, a long-term or lifelong road of medical therapy or whether they move toward an ablation type procedure, um, which can take multiple forms as Dr. Pasquale has just sort of tickled, um, whether that's uh, an entirely endocardial procedure, whether it's an entire a surgical procedure, be it um, uh, endocardial, uh, as we've described with the maze three and maze four procedure, uh, or a less invasive epicardial procedure that we can now do on a beating heart, or um, a combination of those. And oftentimes, given the uh, the um, limitations of our instrumentation currently, um, there are certainly arrhythmias where um, having the best of both worlds, the best from an endocardial standpoint and that from an epicardial standpoint, can achieve the same results as we've seen with, um, you know, open surgery, but with a much, much less invasive um, and better tolerated strategy. So we'll save all that for our next episode, and we look forward to uh, uh, seeing everybody then. So Mario, thank you very much, and um, uh, we'll sign off for now. Thank you, Steve. To find out more about the topics covered on the Doc to Doc podcast, please visit physicianresources.baptisthealth.net.